it must be the day after the title. Yeah, I got to start it off. Welcome to the winner's circle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, we all winners here. We all winners here. You know well, what I mean? Hey, that's all I just want to say, you know. So I just want to start the show off today. You know what I'm saying? Why well, just, just, oh. You, you, you got know. some good, you got some good energy about you. You got, yes, you got sir. lunch. Yes, sir. It's the, this is the day that you get to you get to flex a little bit. Are you wearing the ring too? Wow! Look at that! Holy shit! Hold on, keep it there so we can put this on. Wow, that's sick. Now they all have um, every ring has something like personalized for the from the city or the team. Uh, there's a certain amount of diamonds that represent like you know how many whatever's mm -hmm. happened does does that one have any specifics ours it says on one side of it just uh the right way that was our slogan that was our motto play the right way don't try to hot dog don't try to do extra uh you know extra shit outside your game just play the right way if you see the man open hey make the pass play the right way that was our motto for that whole season and so that's what that that little bit. That's what we got inscribed on the side of our ring. Wow! And uh, that is that a WWE Heavyweight Championship belt? Yep. I'm trying yep. to name see, it specifically because there's so many damn huh? belts now. Well, see here it is. This this is one of the this is before everybody else and all the companies started doing doing it. So the only thing I was able to do was get our names. On the on the belts, right? But we oh. all know what it signifies. Like, if you see me walking down the street with this on, you yeah. don't know what the fuck it say. You just know, like, damn, he got to be a champion or something, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's why you know it was the whole significance with the belts. Um, but wow. no, nah, this this is a wrestling belt, but it's just the whole you know what I'm saying the whole symbolic reasoning of hey, we're champions. Was that made before you won the title? Did you get made after? Was it waiting for you in the locker room when you came back? So check this. So I ordered these, uh, I would say probably about two weeks after we won the title. Okay. And they came about a month and a half later. I ordered one for everybody, like, you know, our GM, uh, assistant GM, trainers, a um, couple of the media guys, and, of course, the team. And um, so it was all in all, I think it was about like 40 something belts. And so they came throughout the summer and I just sat on them. I didn't tell nothing. I didn't say nothing to nobody like, yo, I got something for y'all, this and that. Right. So it was the night before um, the opening game. I talked to the security. I was like, yo, I said, when I come in tomorrow, I said, I'm going to call you when I get to the loading dock because I'm going to need your help. You know, bring a bring one of the um big carts out with the wheels and shit, right? He's like, all right. So call him, hey, come on, meet me outside. So I just put all, all you saw was long ass boxes, right? So he like, man, what the fuck is this? I'm like, you gonna see, watch. And so went into the locker room and, you know, guys went, I, I hid the belts, guys went through their thing, you know, their whole routine, go out the shoe, get tape, this and that. So after, um, after LB did his little meeting and everything, I was like, yo, you know, I got something for y'all. I was like, Jerry, I need your help. I was like, I got something for y'all, man, that we can go out there with. And, man, we rolled out these bins, and I passed everybody a box, and they opened this, and it was the championship belt. It's like, oh, Sick. man. It was, hey, you should have seen the jubilation on everyone's face in that locker room, yo. That's it an was, awesome gift. It was awesome, man. It was awesome. And then I was like, yo, I was like, we got to wear these out. So we was like, all right. So what we did was, um, you know, we put on our, our full warm-up, right? And we just left the jackets off. And then um, we put the belts on and then put our jackets over the belt. So everybody ran out. You know, we in the layup line. And then we then was like, hey, yo, y'all ready? He's like, yeah. And then we took our jackets off and everybody seen the belt. They's like, oh! All you seen was fucking cameras flashing and shit like that, yo. It was it was awesome, man. And, and watching those guys last night, dog, it, it just brought back a lot of memories, man. Bringing back sweet memories, man. You know, it's yeah, man. It was awesome. And that that jersey you're wearing, I'm going to assume, is the game worn because I see the the emblem on the on your right mm -hmm. shoulder. That's yeah, got to be the winner's circle today. 
Yeah, that's the that's the specific finals jersey. I don't know if they still do that today. I can't remember seeing the Larry O'Brien trophy on the court or the jerseys. So that's uh that's pretty unique. So yeah, man, we you know had to get it going with this, man. It was fun. It oh, was I fun. love, so love I, the I, energy. I just thought this is the perfect moment to bring yeah. all of this back out. And then and then you see my sneaks behind me. They're the game worn sneaks that I had. You know, uh, in that game five and shit, you know, they still got the blood stain going on, man. Wow. And everything like that. So, yeah, man, it's the winner's circle today. We all winners here. Another day, another dollar. And it makes me want to fucking holler. Yeah. It is championship morning and if you couldn't tell by our cold open slash introduction to the program today you will notice that there's a little bit different of energy going on and that's what she'd said and visually i think it's kind of speaks for itself what's we, we just discussed the the outfit the hat the belt we've got the stories Got the shoes with the blood stains on in the background. Why? Why are you in this type of mood today, She To see in the finals and the Larry O'Brien just get those competitive juices flowing from when you were competing back in the day. Yes, yes, you already know, Wob. It's like, man. First of all, first and foremost, I'm gonna get it out of the way. Congratulations to the Denver Nuggets. First time in franchise history that you guys have won an NBA championship. Hey, you guys deserve it. Go ahead and party out. Second, it's that time, Wob. You know what I'm saying? It, it just brings back nostalgia of uh, being in a locker room and, and, you know, being out there when you see it counting down to the zeros and then all the confetti's falling and, you know, you got your fans and everything. Like, it just brings back nostalgia watching that last night with the Nuggets. And, man, it was – it's awesome. It's awesome. It's a great feeling, man. So, I – I'm feeling good. I'm feeling proud for them. Um, and hey, welcome to the winner's circle. We all winners here. I can see it radiating out of your body language that whether it was Denver or Miami, there's a special camaraderie that you share with current age players. And you know what? The the stigma or the the reputation right now is some of the older guys don't like the younger guys because they make more money. They're softer. They load manage. But with you right now, just my personal opinion, you can't help but smile. You came in here, you know, laughing and feeling it. You're flashing the ring and it's taking you back. It's like you're a kid again. And it's that type of infectious energy, which, uh, which I hope our audience shares as well, because we have reached the finish line of the 2023 NBA season. As she just mentioned, yes. Denver Nuggets are champions. Uh, first in franchise history, you've got an all-time great player who was a two-time MVP. Now, technically, you can say it's a three-peat that he's got a finals MVP in addition to two regular season ones. She'd asked all year. He wanted to be proven to him in the playoffs that Jokic could live up to this potential. And boy, did he mm -hmm. pass with flying colors. We will get to all of that and more. Put the series in the season into perspective. But as always, we like to lead off our program with what I call a moment in time. And while I have successfully stumped Sheed throughout this entire season, I've brought... I've dug up some footage from local Sacramento affiliates all the way to him walking around the tunnels <laughs> yes. inside the Palace of Auburn Hills to some really obvious ones where he has just simply stared down referees and got injected. Today will be the easiest for you to guess, Cheed. You're already wearing the answer. The date is June 15th, 2004, and I obviously picked that for a reason. Yes, yes, man. Like, like I was saying, that... That right there. So let me let me go through the whole morning. Let me get, let me give you that morning. So you know, woke up. Of course, going through regular things. Um, of course, again, you know, making breakfast for the kids, or you know, the kids are up. You know, they're happy because hey, they're about to go on break and all of this and stuff for the summer. So I'm already up, and after pretty much like the first maybe hour or so of daddy duty then i'm i'm focusing i'm concentrating like all right 
we can win this shit today, yo. <laughs> like, like we can we can actually we can actually go ahead and lock this in and be immortalized in 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 history. We can win this today. And just thinking of that now, I'm not thinking afterwards like, oh man, we're gonna party and we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. No, I'm thinking of we could win this today. So what do I have to do for us to win? And that's when you go back into that whole game mode. You're breaking it down. You're breaking your matchups down. You know what I'm saying? What you do on offense, like, all right, last game, you know, I might have had like two, three rebounds. So then let me make sure that I go ahead and make that extra, extra effort to try to get more because you're already excited. Like, like we all saw the energy that Denver had last night. And and, and they, they had that. They had it's like a it's like a shark smelling blood in the water from miles away like and they get that rush going going to it denver had that rush every possession it was up and down fast paced you know you felt it. it's like man they on the ropes right here all we got to do is just deliver that ko punch and they did it and that's how i felt like man we did this shit sat there in the locker room I had I'm in the shower area and shit with a couple other players. You know, we got some cold ones in our hands, and we sitting there like that's when it really hit us. Like, damn, yo, we the champs. Like, we just beat every other team in the league. Like, we the champs, yo. And that's when that moment set. Like for for Denver, it hasn't set in yet. They still right now. They still partying. I guarantee you one, at least two or three of those guys are still partying right now and probably threw up a couple times, you know what I'm saying, whatever. But <laughs> they partying. Because that's what we got. Man, we didn't leave the palace. When we won, we didn't leave the palace until 7, 8 a.m. that next morning. So wow. I know those guys are somewhere still partying. They got to <laughs> be. If not, it's sacrilegious. But they got to be partying. You stayed at the you stayed at the arena to party. You didn't go out to downtown Detroit or or like a club or something. You stayed and partied in the well, locker room. Yeah, we stayed. We stayed. Well, actually, what it was, it was on the concourse area. They had a nice restaurant up there. So afterwards, it was all of our friends and family. Um, we all party up there. Everybody in the front office, you know, all the workers, uh, um, our in house media, and all of that stuff. We all party to the wee hours. Uh, management, first thing they said was, look, congratulations. Everything is on us tonight. So everybody was like, oh, bet, and loved it. It was the buffet. The restaurant was fully open, stayed open the whole time while we were there. So if it was like 3 in the morning, he was like, yo, can I get some, you know, chicken Alfredo or something like that? Guess what they would have made for you? Some chicken Alfredo back there in the kitchen if whatever you're looking for wasn't already sitting out. You know, the liquor, it was like, hey, we, everybody in there was drunk. Like, man, it was, yo, it was great times, man. It was great times. And I'm thankful to the Most High and the basketball guys that I was able to get at least one championship out of the 16-year career I played. You spoke about the morning you woke up, and it hit you then that, oh, my God, we got a chance to, to win this and be, quote, immortalized. How do you prevent that from becoming an over, becoming a burden almost? And let me use Denver as an example, because last night going into halftime sheet, they're down by seven points. They're shooting single digits from the three-point line, not because they're nervous, but something was causing them to miss wide open threes for an hour plus. And when you wake up with that type of pressure on your shoulders, you're also at home with the pressure of needing to close out in front of the home fans and delivering them that that feeling like of course you want to do that but how do you prevent that from affecting your game that got you to that point you got to stay focused at some point you got to bring it back to reality like look the first of all the game is no we aren't the champs yet so you got to stay focused for denver with them being down seven that was that was that challenge and that, and again, I guarantee you, I guarantee you. Now, I don't, I don't know personally. I don't know uh, anybody outside of KCP on that team, but I guarantee you, somebody in that locker room at halftime reminded them 
look, we go out here, we do what we got to do. We rebound, we defend, we share that ball, we run. We got the energy. And motherfucking one half, we're going to be NBA champions. In 24 minutes, we can be NBA champions. And that's what sets in. That's that's the goal. Because that's what you that's what you're there for. That's what you're there for. This is that moment. Like, you know how every athlete says, oh, I'm in the moment. It was a moment. This and that. This was their moment. Because, man, just just think, if Miami would have won, wow. Okay, that's carrying that energy going back to Miami, right? Mm-hmm. Totally different ball game. Now, Miami's coming with that, all right, we home. We got to go out here and get this. We fighting for our life type of energy. But that second half, Denver came out like, all right, look, let's get this shit together, man. And they they play ball. They play ball. And the one thing I like about them, they they play team ball. Two reactions which got to me and spoke to me, Sheed. The first of which, the rookie on Denver, Christian Brown. He has three high school titles. Last year, he won a national championship with Kansas against our Tar Heels. Rookie season this year for the Denver Nuggets, is an NBA champion. That is quite literally perfect. I'm thinking of that scene from Remember the Titans where he goes, with all due respect, Mm -hmm. Coach, we have been perfect. When you say nobody's perfect, that's not true. We are perfect. Like Christian Brown's basketball record is almost perfect. Now on the, that was so watching him react as a teenager practically and just continuing this success is a best case scenario. But on the other side of the fence, watching Jeff Green, go down to his knees in uh, emotion. And what hit him there, that man, you look at his history of teams yes. that he had played for in the NBA. He was drafted, or I don't know if he was technically drafted, but he played for the Seattle Supersonics. He's been around for so long. All of the, yes. the journeymen, the journey that it took him 15 years to finally hoist the trophy. And then he had an influential part of it. He wasn't just someone who signed on and sat at the end of the yep. bench. Like his presence mattered in a lot of different ways. And to see the emotion yep. of the moment overcome him and to see him celebrate that way, it made me think of you in, in a way. And that not because uh, it took you that long to get it, but you know what? You come into the NBA in the mid nineties, you, you, f- you fall just a bit short with Carolina in the, in the NCAA tournament. You have to face Kobe and Shaq when you, pro- you have probably the second best team in the NBA for a considerable amount of time, not able to get up over the hump. And then you finally get there well, a decade into your career. So yep. I'm sure you can relate to Jeff Green specifically. In a lot of ways, and you know, he's a journeyman at this point in his career, kind of similar to where you were at with Boston when you played in the finals that year against LA. But overcoming the Lakers, who had been your biggest personally, your biggest rival to that point because of how many times they eliminated you personally from the playoffs, or in this case, you right. faced them in Detroit in the finals. I'm kind of just, I guess, want you to put into perspective someone that it takes 10 years of NBA to win your first title, how that would have, how that felt differently than if you would have won it, let's say your rookie season or immediately. Did it mean more in, I guess, in a way is what I'm getting at. Oh, it definitely meant a lot more because you got to think of all those hours that you put into the gym after you became an NBA player. Um, you got to think of all the the hard games, all the injuries, all the rivalry games. You know, you you, you put all of that into a perspective. Uh, the Christmas games, um, you know, we might be playing on New Year's or the day after New Year's. You know, you put all of that into perspective because you going to sit down and say, like, we the kings of the mountain. Like, we sitting on top of the mountain right now. And that whole struggle it took for you to climb up that mountain with again, as you mentioned, with uh, with the young fella, he's a three time high school champion and he's the NCAA champion. You know, that's a lot of work he put in there. You know, mm-hmm. that's not a, a easy thing to do to repeat as champion over and over. You know, very few guys do that in their career. I think in football, from what I know, of course, uh, it was Edwards Claire, uh, Hilare or Hilare, I like to call him Hilare, but 
he did the same thing with LSU. You know, he got his championship with LSU, and then his first two years in the NFL, shit, you in the Super Bowl. Like, so I understand that feeling. So with Jeff, man, you talking your whole career. If I'm him, that's it. Thank you, y'all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the best way to go out. You know what I'm saying? It's on top. You know, I I was able to go to three finals, and the last finals I won to, I lost. But for him, he has he has a chance to do something that a lot of players our age don't do. That's the retire on top. Retire that champion. So it's like forever, you know, he's in that club now. It's gonna be called champ. And I and I and I personally liked it. I was definitely rooting for Jeff, friend of mine, someone I know. And he did I, I was rooting for him because he's he's the veteran. He's the old guy out there, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And again, look at it. Goes back to having that veteran leadership. And Miami had theirs too with Udonis Aslam, but that veteran leadership that was needed for that team. So I don't want to ask this question and uh, uh, what's the correct term here? First of all, again, I'm thinking of just Christian Brown, who again has only been in the NBA for one year. But you specifically, um, you have a lot of what Bam Adebayo is currently experiencing during his career where he's at right now. Because for two to three straight years, I even before I started doing this show with you, I remember as a fan, and I as I continue to pull up the footage to talk about the specific moments with you, all of those years that you put in defending Shaq, and you've told stories about going to the locker room after and stuff like that, Def- uh, coming back against the Dallas Mavericks, down 3-0 to tie the series against Dirk Nowitzki and mm-hmm. Steve Nash, and how many damn big shots that you hit in addition to the defense that you had to play. And Bam Adebayo coming, if we if we did this rankings, if you will, of most important players before the 2023 NBA Finals, we probably would have agreed on either Jimmy or Nikola Jokic is going to be number one, number two. Then right. it's Jamal Murray, number three, and it's Bam Adebayo, number four. And now Bam, between his run in the bubble, ultimately falling short to the great Anthony Davis and LeBron at the peak of their powers, but having a super memorable play like you did in defeat with the block of Jason Tatum at the rim in the conference finals. Fast forward to now, Bam Adebayo has to take on the burden of defending what is the best, and we can say it, he's the best player in the world as of this very moment in Nikola Jokic, Mm -hmm. putting in 40 minutes of work in addition to that averaging 20 shots a game for a guy that's not supposed to be the high volume, high quantity, and he still (laughs) falls short again. And he's so good, and he's evolved to the point that he's becoming a cornerstone piece on a team with championship aspirations. I was hoping that you might be able to provide just, I don't know if he's going to watch this, but boy, do the two of you have similar career parallels in the way that you got there really close a couple of times you put in fucking work big time performances and ultimately it was it wasn't enough but you ultimately ended up getting there so if if bam was here right now what would you say to him to kind of get him re-energized for next year to get back after it well it's, it's a long it's a long dog day process But first, you got to relax. Take care of your body. Take your family, you know, your wife, kids, all that. Go on vacation. Um, One, because they deserve it because they've been there with you, the ups and downs, the whole season. So that's your number one right there. You got to you got to tend to family because now you're not playing basketball no more. So now you are that dad. You know, you are that stay home dad now. Um, And with that, to me. I've. I I, I had the feeling that, like, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Like, because, you know, I'm around my kids. And that was, like, that's the whole bottom line. Honestly, overall, outside of my personal, of course, my personal is to win an NBA championship. Who doesn't want to be, you know, the top of their craft? But my whole overall line was, is for my family to be happy. And after I lost, you know, took that hard loss, when we had that meltdown in 2000, went on vacation with my family and, and, and my kids made it feel better. 
You know, yeah, of course, you're going to run into your fans who this and that, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I ignored that. But my kids and my family, being with my family made it feel better. Because why? Because they still cheer for me. My kids were still my number one fans, my daughter, my sons. You know, they were still, oh, dad, let's go play this and that. Yeah, they cared about the basketball, but they didn't really give two shits about it because they just see me as dad. Opposing yeah. to, yo, she, wow, it's a power forward in the NBA, bang, bang, bang. But, and that's what made me feel better. So I, I would have to say for Bam, now be with family. Get your mind off of basketball. You you, you can't think about basketball for the next few weeks. Um, take advantage of this time off. Uh, go on your trips with your family, with your kids. Uh, my Duke, you know, whoever. Just, just. Get away from basketball for a minute. Be around your loved ones. And, yeah, you're going to hear the criticism or whatever, but just know, like, look, yeah, you are going to play basketball again, but, hey, all right, let people speak their piece or whatever, but your biggest focus is your family. And that that may be uh, a majority of the answer of the question I'm about to ask you, but you are such a treasure chest of information, stories, and experience that I, we have we have good vibes in this conversation right now, but... I want to ask you because you have, whether it was on Portland against the Lakers, Detroit very soon thereafter winning the title, in Boston against those same Los Angeles Lakers, you have experienced the highest of highs, but also the lowest of lows multiple times. And while the euphoria of celebrating in that locker room, staying in the arena till the sunrise is, is the ultimate payoff in dividends back to you, because you have the experience, yeah, I understand the answer of getting back, getting with your family, that always helps. Having your kids say, dad, dad, and you know, that, that puts life into perspective. But those yeah. moments coming back into the locker room, it can be for any of those three teams that you almost reached the mountaintop with. You know, that I imagine you're not, you're not sitting in there for an hour, you know, just uh, scrolling your phones or staring off into the abyss. What what traditionally happens in an NBA locker room? Does the coach come in and address the team? Does the general manager or the president come down there and say some words? Does everyone just grab their shit and get out of there? Like I don't know. I would love to hear. Well, for for the finals, um, you know, when I was with the Pistons and we lost that game, that game seven in San Antonio, San Antonio, excuse me, and when I was with Boston and we lost that game seven in L.A. Um, you know, of course, the locker room is somber. Um, it's not too much being said. Cats are pretty much thinking about the whole, the whole, as I like to call it, the whole Brian McKnight. I shoulda, coulda, woulda. <laughs> um, but you can't think of that process because one, the game is over. You already know you don't have another game until the next season. Um, then you have. The front office guys come down, come in the locker room. You know, everyone, of course, gives gives their, you know, two-minute end-of-the-year speech as far as the front office guys, your GM, your owner maybe, um, the coach himself. And, you know, guys just – some guys might want to say something and some guys don't. Um, but we all know you gotta you gotta handle it as a professional. Like it's a, always gonna be a winner and a loser, but you always gotta take it in stride. You know the same way we take losing in stride, you gotta take winning in stride. So it was tough. It was tough, you know. But the <laughs> to be honest, you wanna know the real shit about it? To be mm -hmm. honest, <laughs> it ain't even a locker room part, dog. For me. It was them long ass plane rides home yeah. with that L. Like, yeah. oh, that's that's the shit. Because now it's like, like you know, if you're at home or somewhere, you can you can go to your comfort zone. Like, oh man, I'm gonna go to the theater room, watch some movies, or you know, I'm gonna go to the kitchen, cook some, whatever the case may be, for you to feel comfortable, right? But when you on that plane, it ain't nothing but you on that fucking seat, and you just sitting there thinking. And then, you know, you, you looking up front, the coaches usually sit up front, and there's a couple coaches that might be watching some film, you know, breaking it down because that's what they do. You got a lot of gym rats who are uh, video guys and, and assistant coaches, so they might be breaking some film down, and you just sitting there on that <laughs> long-ass plane ride home. Yo. Like, <laughs> you don't want to say shit to nobody. Like, you ain't trying to get in a car. Ain't no car game. 
none of that shit. It's just it's uh. a, a somber moment. Like you just sit back and reflect. Like you know, damn. Like yeah. we lost that shit. You know what? You know what that did for you specifically, though. I think it makes you appreciate your accomplishment even more. Like because you've oh, you're not you're not the, the real. The reason why I brought up Christian Brown is because he lives in this euphoric world, which he has created. He deserves all the credit for, but his high school career to his college career to now his his uh, his NBA career, I, he hasn't had just that daunting, devastating at the precipice before actually winning a title. And when you finally get there, I have to assume. That's part of the reason why you like getting dressed up in your gear, bringing out the heavyweight heavyweight title, putting on the ring, because God, that shit felt good, man. And I, oh, I get I, I get to live vicariously through you. But part of the dog chasing cars mentality, in theory, is what do you do when you actually catch it? Is the thrill in the chase, or is there a sense of? accomplishment which means more than the chase itself and for to see you for to see no no to see it pay off for you to this day that that one w supersedes everything else that happened that's what matters the most and you're unique in a way because you have so much experience doing it so Mm -hmm. is that a fair hypothesis kind of assessment of i don't mean to speak for you but i i I brought up those I brought up those those sad moments because I wanted to come full circle and just kind of r- remind you that when you actually pull it off and do it, God, that damn, that's got to feel good. Though. Yeah, it's, it's definitely always two sides of the coin, and I think I think that's what makes me appreciate the one that I have more. Um, I think for me, I would I would rather have won it around the time that I did, you know, after when I'm that NBA veteran. Because it just means a little bit more. Like, now don't get me wrong. With the young fella from Denver, yeah, now, you know, you're a champion for shit. Three years in a row. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Three, four years in a row or or on, on all levels. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, like, shit. That success ain't going to be there for the rest of your career. So now it's going to be those those dog days. You know, opposing to fighting for like, man, we almost made it. I know my body breaking down, but I got to come back next year to try to win it. And that's on the flip side of, hey, I won it earlier in my career. Like what I need to play for, what what else I need to do? I don't need to do nothing else. You know, it's a different mentality with it. Unless he has that hunger mentality. And it, it, it involves a lot of shit, luck. Uh, you know, it involves uh, right the right moves. Uh, you know, this guy, mm-hmm. that guy, whatever the case may be. But man, it's yeah, it's, it's it's a good feeling, and and man, it's a fucking terrible feeling. Yeah, uh, again, I, that's I, life I though. Both sides of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always. Hey, my mom told me one thing in life is the same as as sports. It's always going to be a winner, and it's always going to be a loser. <laughs> So which one do you want to be? <laughs> good philosophy. Good good perspective of uh mm-hmm. of of basketball and life itself. I have a I have a couple more questions that uh before we just discuss the finals, uh, the actual play on the court. The time between winning the title, the celebrating and the parade, you usually have two or three days in between. What are those days like and then being on that float? I I I've never been on a championship. I lived in New Orleans, but I've never been a part of a Mardi Gras flow. What's it like being up there with a million people across the city just celebrating you? I, it's, I don't even know how to fathom what that experience is like. It's, it's euphoric. It's euphoric. Um, well, to answer the first part of your question, what do you do in, in the meantime between when you win it and the parade? <laughs> Shit, you partying. Here's the thing. I only could, I only can speak for me. So for me, of course, my daytime it was the kids. You know what I'm saying? Because my kids was in school or or a summer program or something. Of course, always had to get them that time. But that's when my kids was going to bed at like eight or nine o'clock. Yo, 
10 o'clock on certain days, 11 o'clock, I tell my I told my wife, all right, I'll be back in a minute. Yo, I'm going to party. Then there's some nights, you know, we might get the babysitter. We out partying together with everybody else on the team. Like, we was partying. It was, <laughs> like, I, I guarantee you, I'll tell you this. For the first week and a half, two weeks, I could probably say I was drunk at least 12, 11 or 12 out of the 14 days of those two weeks after. <laughs> I know what y'all were up and then, to and on the South Beach and the Eastern Conference oh, Finals, man. let alone when you're done with the season. <laughs> and then and then here we go. It's, it's they like, all right, yeah, we're going to do the parade Thursday, this and that, that, that. So it's like, all right. So, you know, you wake up early in the morning. You know, you got got the kids. The kids is ready. Got to drive down. Our, for ours, it was a uh, downtown Detroit. So we drove to a um, local community center um, that was not far from the parade strip, was which was Jefferson Avenue, which is a long street, major strip in Detroit. Um, so we everybody meet at the recreation center. So now everybody gets in their cars or their trucks or you know on a bus, whatever. That's part of the parade. And so I'm sitting in the car, you know, it's, it's some type of little convertible, little Chevrolet convertible, something. And sitting in the car, yo, and riding down the street and motherfuckers is cheering and you got confetti and all you hear and all the fans and this and that. And I'm just looking. It's people hanging out the windows of office buildings. It's people over flooded with parking garages that's hanging over looking, yo. It was it was like the movies. It was like the movies. You ever you ever you ever see how uh watch an old film from back in the 20s and 30s about the war, and then the guys come home from D-Day and they riding in the streets of New York and it's the big parade celebration and all the Navy guys are hugging all the women. That's <laughs> how that shit was. Yeah. It was like, man, every you know, it was you just felt the energy and the joy from the city. Like, and the other thing about it. And which which is sad and unfortunate that happened in Denver was the after effects with uh, a few of those people being injured with the shooting out there. Um, that's that's a sad thing because that's the time your city is supposed to have everyone gets along, you know. Especially if you a sports nut, it don't matter if you black, white, Puerto Rican, Chinese, Mexican. If you are a fan of that team. And y'all just want a championship, man. I'm I'm not looking at you as you know the white dude who's doing this or that, or you know they're not looking at me as oh this is the angry black dude all the time. No, we all cheering in the streets and jumping in the streets as fans. That's how it was for me in Detroit. We felt that whole energy. Everybody got along. Everybody high fiving. As we going down the street, cheering, taking pictures, you know, you had some guys doing the champagne pops and all of that. And then to get there to the stage, and you looking at more than half of the city, like it was over two million people that came to our parade. Yeah. Like, man, that's yo, that the energy, like shit. I could have went out and played another game right there that day. Damn. And just to just to clarify, you said Denver with the shooting. I, it was Detroit, right? It, there's nothing that you were talking about last night with Denver. No, no, yeah, Detroit. Yeah, right? It was it okay. was a. No, no, it was a couple of uh, it was a couple of shootings in Denver after oh. with their celebration. Oh, yeah, I didn't it see was that. Unfortunate, yeah, man, oh, yeah. it's, it's okay. sad. It's sad because the city should be the city should be in unison right now because everyone was cheering for them. So why would it stop? We just won a championship. I'm not gonna go back to the, my normal bullshit. No, nah, right. we all Nuggets right. fans. Yo, let's pop our collar. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. For Hopefully sure. they catch the idiots that that did that shit, man. Because it was it was uncalled for, bro. For sure, absolutely. Um, let's. Uh, I have a couple quick hitters. We'll talk about the Nuggets in the Heat specifically. I just just because you're Sheed, I know I can ask you a couple of questions and get a brutally honest opinion about it. So I have two, and the first of which is, what are your feelings of when the trophy presentation occurs? You know who always touches that thing first is the owner. Do you think the players should touch it first before the owner? And not just the Pistons specifically, owners in general. What? What Do you care? Are you apathetic? Is it weird? Some people don't like it. Um, who should touch that thing first? 
for well, all right, two sides up. For me, it didn't matter. Cause shit, we's a champ. So I don't care who touched it first, we all gonna massage her. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> it don't matter. But for for me, I I would have to, you know, it's it's hey, leadership. So of course the owner, you know, you you should have the owner, of course, touch the trophy first and then present the trophy to the team. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, take it from there. And I wish I one thing, oh man, I hope Denver could do this. And they should do this. But I'm I was I was kind of ticked that we weren't able to do it. But then again, for us back then, it wasn't a thing. It was more for hockey. I wish I could have took the trophy with me to my neighborhood. Oh, yeah. If I could if I could have yeah. took that Larry O'Brien back to my community center, back to my high school, to let to let all of the people who supported me, who kicked me in the butt, who smacked me in the back of my head to keep me motivated and to never quit this and that for them to get that enjoyment and feel that. But for me winning it, I, I took the ring back home and you know, a lot of a lot of people, a lot of my elders, I gave them the ring like, here, take take your picture, you know, this and that. Damn. You helped me earn this. It's like, it's yeah. all of us. You know, it's, it's that village. Awesome. Uh, well, you said there were two sides. Was that just one side or was that both side? Is that you have a Jekyll well, and Hyde about you? Is is yeah, that I mean what, <laughs> again that 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 other side is now with me losing. I have to embrace the city. I gotta take it. Whatever, whatever criticism, I gotta mm-hmm. take it. Um, you know, I'm I'm still I still gotta go out. You know, after we lost to San Antonio, I still went out, you know, still did the regular family things with my wife, my kids, still hung out with the homies. Um, And I had to hear it. It wasn't shit I could say. You know, I felt like I let the fans down, let the people down of Detroit and Boston when I was playing. It's like, but to me, they had every right to say, um, you know, maybe we ain't shit or we could have tried harder or we should have did this. We should have did that. Hey, ain't nothing I can say because now if it was during the regular season and you said that, okay, I could dispute and rebuttal with you. Like, yo, yeah, we played them again. So watch next time. Da, da, da. But yo, that's it. Hmm. Ain't nothing I can say. I, I got to hear it from the people at the supermarket all the way down to the guys on the street that's working at the bank or wherever. I got to hear it. And that's part of that's part of that. That's part of that hunger. That's part of that maturation. So now let's say for next year, yeah, Jimmy fell short a couple of times. So now let's say Miami gets a piece, they get a, a, a true center. Well, now let's say fast forward, Miami's back in the finals next year and they win it. I think that would mean a lot to a lot of those guys on the team, because now you don't went through the hard shit. You don't went through, we got to get out the second, I mean, we got to get out the first round, to we got to make it to the conference finals, to we got to get out the conference finals, to we got to make it to the finals. We got to come out the finals winners. If not, we got to get back there. What is it going to take for us to get back there? Hmm. And that's where the guys have to stick together. You start to look at, then you start to look at the uh, the BOP, the basketball operations. So now, who's the free agent? Who's up next year? Because that determines how guys play. You know, you've seen it, Wob, on, on, on all levels, all sports. When guys are in contract years, some guys, a lot of guys play better. You know, a lot of guys shoot better. You're going to hit the baseball better. You're going to pitch better. You're going to run the basketball, I mean, the football better. You're going to throw the football better when you're in that contract year because you're trying to get that money. So you're going to do all the little shit that it takes for you to be successful. Well, those are all the little things that you think about when you lose. (laughs) And you think about, again, the whole Brian McKnight, man, I should have did this. I could have did that. If my leg wasn't hurting, if my knee wasn't hurting, you know, you, you you think about all of that, but you just gotta go back to the drawing board. All right, it's over. 
with the fam. After the fam shit is over, you back home. All right. I'm back in the gym. And for me, that's what it was. Like, for me to work out in the summer, I just got shots up. It was just shots. You know, shots and post moves. It wasn't, it wasn't nothing more than that, than about a half hour. Because I knew exactly what I wanted to work on. I wasn't going into the gym lollygagging. Yo, I just need somebody to help me rebound and pass me the ball. Putting shots up. All right, half hour. You know, you do that a couple times throughout the summer. And then you just on and off throughout the summer. Some guys might come back. Uh, you might have a couple guys in town where you play some games. Anywhere from one-on-one -on -one to five-on-five. Um, you know, you always got to stay sharp. So now it's like you got that edge. You got that hunger now. And so if you got that same team that's coming back, like say everybody's coming back on Miami. You know, they went to the finals. They experienced it. They lost. They got their ass kicked. Yo, I know we a better team than this is probably what some of those guys are saying. And so if they all come back, we got to prove we a better team than this. Hmm. Words to live by. Win, loss, tie. Don't really matter. The work is still the same. And that title only lasts until you hit training camp or in Sheet's case, hitting the gym and getting shots up mm -hmm. for the next season. Cause there is still basketball to be played for a majority of these guys, maybe with the exception of Jeff Green, he may just ride off into the sunset and deservingly so. Um, Jeff, right off into the sunset, bro. I'm telling you, fuck that. <laughs> Go into sports casting or whatever. You the champ, you going out the champ, man. You going out the champ. Amen. Amen. And for some of those guys, I was curious, some of those guys that uh, on this year's Denver team, the example that everyone's talking about right now is Bones Highland, who requested a trade, wasn't really meshing. He's still going to get a ring. He's still technically a champion because he was a part of it. Uh, I'm sure you had some players on the Pistons team and and uh, some of your other finals contenders that were a part of the team, then got either traded or let go. If Not that you were ever in that situation, but how do you think they should feel about getting a ring? Is, is a ring a ring? Like you were still part of the team and you should be proud of it? Um, or someone like yourself that had such an important role in the actual championship itself, would I feel kind of weird being the guy that was just at the end of the bench that didn't get along and eventually got traded? I don't know if the ring would mean the same to me personally, but everyone's different. And since you've been in the trenches with guys, that aren't getting minutes and or are disgruntled, you know, do they feel the same way about being proud of their championship? I, I don't know. I'm kind of just thinking out loud. Well, it's, it's weird you say that, man. So I ain't going to mention his name, but it's one cat that was on that Pistons team when we won the championship. He ain't do nothing. He didn't come to the parade. He didn't come to the ring ceremony. They sent him his ring in the mail. Oh, um, he ain't do none of that. And you know why? All because the last two games, well, actually, I take it back. What in the last two games? All because he wasn't on the playoff roster and we were playing L.A. and he was from L.A. So oh. he felt disrespected. So he was he never really wanted to come around after the regular season. You know, it was like, man, fuck it. He was in and out. You might hear he in town, but he wouldn't come to the gym or the arena, this and that. So it is what it is. Guys guys like that, you know, he was on the rod. We respected the fact that he was on the roster for a majority of the season. So he got his ring and he got his share, you know, and, and that's how we pretty much base it with the playoffs. You know, every with every level you climb in the playoffs, your, your, uh, your purse is more. So... You know, we we respected the fact, like, all right, we we're gonna go ahead and break him down on his part and this and that. But yeah, that that shit surprised. Like, man, I don't give a fuck if I ain't get no time the whole season, which he barely got. And now you want to bitch because you ain't on the playoff roster and we playing the Lakers. I'm like, man, you should be ashamed of yourself, dog. You a fucking NBA champion. No matter what people say, they can say, oh man, you ain't do shit. You wasn't this, you wasn't that, but at the end of it, you could be like this. <laughs> yeah. 
my name. You see my name. You look the roster up. You see my name. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it just it just totally shocked me that this guy wouldn't come to any of the celebration. And this is what you, when you're a little boy, this, this is what you in the schoolyard for. This is what you're saying in the schoolyard to yourself. Oh, it's five seconds left in the championship. Uh, she got the ball. Oh, boom, boom, boom. And, oh, hit the shot. Oh, we win the championship. <laughs> and you got a chance to actually live that shit for real? And you don't want to be part of it? No. Nah. Yeah. I am i don't care if I'm the 13th, 14th man. I got 30 seconds the whole season. Guess what? Man, I'm going to be right there. I'm going to be breaking <laughs> it down, partying and everything. You know what? Man, we the chance. Yeah, like like you immortalized. I, I I don't know who this individual is, but I imagine as time passed, they probably may regret just not being a part of that because you know. I hope when, they did. When the emotion of the moment you know dissipates and then the pettiness wears off naturally over time and it turns to apathy, you're like, damn, I missed out on you know partying with my guys because I was upset with whatever situation. Maybe maybe it was not the case. Maybe they're still holding that grudge to this day, but. You know what? There are examples like that, even in victory, which is what makes uh, winning a championship so, so interesting at this level. Just all the facets that go into it and uh, having you to be my muse of of uh, in- inquiry, if you will, and just learning more about it. Because as as a fan, I I haven't played in the NBA. You know, I've worked in the NBA, but I've certainly not been in the locker room as a player. And uh, <laughs> we can only we can only consume with the media that we are provided with the stories that are told. So when we actually get to hear some of this stuff from behind the curtain, from people that have been in the trenches, you know, that is, that is something I look forward to as a content creator. And I certainly find proprietary uh, is your brain and experience. And I guess we'll, uh, we'll kind of put a bow on this season and just as I'll, I'll ask about your just, finals opinion of the Nuggets, the Heat, Jokic, what are your takeaways from it um, wh- while watching it? Were you pointing something out that that ended up being important and vital and ultimately was a part of the results? You know, what, what are your takeaways from the 2023 season and finals? Well, it was, it was a good season. Um, definitely a very entertaining season. Uh, of course, you got to tip your hat to the champions, no matter if you like them or not, no matter if you respect them or not. At the end of the day, they are the champs. Um, it was definitely a memorable season with us having uh, a new NBA scoring king as far as in LeBron James taking over the scoring title from the captain. Mm. Um it was definitely a, a, an exciting season, an exciting season. A lot of milestones cherished, um, and man, and and Denver was the, you know, the cherry on top of the ice cream, on top of the cake. They, what, they've been in the NBA since the merger in what mm-hmm. the fifties, sixties, sixties would so, be my guess. Yeah, yeah. So here it is now to finally seventies. Not only they so so they they what one for one if I'm not mistaken right it's the first time that franchise ever went to the finals yeah it's the yeah. first time they won yeah right one for yeah, one that's, that's one for one yeah that's, that's pretty good that's pretty good uh pretty good percentage right there Denver Denver um, has uh two things under their belt now they are the longest they have the longest odd upset in NBA playoff history when they were the eight seed I think they took down the Sonics with Dikembe. Uh, they were something yep. like 20 to one to win that series and they pulled it off and now they've got their yep. first title as well. And we come full circle on the show because, you know, you and I have argued uh, in the past between when we were talking about regular season MVP. I remember when the 76ers played Denver in Philly and Joel B just had a dominant performance and it felt like in that moment, the regular season MVP, not the playoffs, but the regular season MVP was likely decided that night because of that mm-hmm. shot. But then I was trying to put into context the, that there's still a lot of season left. Jokic this, Jokic that. He's still, 
you know, is, is two time reigning. And our conversation was always coming back to you having to see what Jokic does in the playoffs and if it translates all of this regular season mm-hmm. success. So while you're sitting here saying you got to tip your hat to the champs, I just I want to hear it hear it from you. Has Jokic finally done enough for you as a former player and a now a viewer of the NBA and a consumer of the product? Are you ready to just say Jokic did it? It's it's in stone. There's nothing that you can take away from him. And now that same mindset of having to see him do it in the regular season, someone's going to have to take it away from him next regular season, right? They're going to have to approve it in the playoffs. Does your mentality still now stretch to whoever threatens Jokic's proverbial best player in the NBA? Did Jokic do that for you finally? Did he get you there? Oh, no question. He, he, okay. he definitely did it this year. Um, I, I definitely – Tip my hat to the man. Um, he did what a lot of naysayers said he couldn't do. Um, he did what a lot of people who doubted him, which I was one of them. Um, and he proved me wrong, which I don't have no problem with saying that. Um, I mean, ain't shit else you can say about him. He definitely did. Well, well, now I guess I guess the only critique you could probably say is, okay, he got to play more defense or, okay, he ain't got no defensive player of the year war and all this or that. If if cats want to be petty, but no, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be petty or I'm not a petty dude like that. But no, he, he definitely proved all the naysayers and the doubters wrong. Cause I went out there and did it. Yeah. You right. Uh, for the last couple of years, we fell short. We had a good team. I won MVP. We fell short, but here's the thing. I don't know why, but it's, it's I guess it's something with the basketball guys. From the way that it is with his career, if you look at it, when he gets MVPs, gets knocked out the playoffs, he don't get the MVP, he wins it. And it's like, hmm, is he still, is he not an MVP caliber player? But yet he is. Mm -hmm. And definitely I have to admit that Jokic is one of the uh, best big men to play the game. And he reminds me of a young Sabonis. Um, and right now, I would have to agree with with the statement or, or a line that you said in the beginning of the show about him being, right now, he's the best basketball player in the world. He's a big man. Is a That's big the other man. part I like about it. It's a big yeah. man. It ain't a guard. It ain't a, a, a fucking no. wingman. It's a big man. So, the- yeah, he but. He definitely gets, um, you know, he gets my respect for sure. No doubt about it. He's, he's in that winning circle. He proved all the naysayers wrong. And that's the biggest thing. And and the thing I, I actually like about it as well, he ain't say shit. He just went out and played. Mm-hmm. As you always say, to get respect, you got to give respect. And at the same time, you have to perform and do all those things. And yep. I think he checked all of those boxes. Jamal Murray coming back from the injury. <laughs> My big question was going to be, mm. could the two of them coexist? They're both great players. There was only one ball last time I checked. We knew they had chemistry in the bubble, but could the post-injury Jamal Murray with the two-time MVP version of Jokic, not the bubble Jokic, but the this mm-hmm. version, could they coexist? Not only did they, but they might do it again next year. This is the same team mm. that they're returning. They're favorites at sportsbooks for a reason. And, yeah, it uh, got to be. Yeah, there's there's really no reason to believe they don't have a chance of doing this again, pending any injuries, suspensions, or whatever. Right. But that's why they play the game, and they have now earned that uh, that reputation of we're the top dogs, and until proven otherwise, they've got that for the next year. Uh, before and we that's, sign, and off, that's a hell of a swagger that that they're gonna walk with this summer, this whole summer. You hear me? <laughs> Everywhere they go, people gonna know who they are. Everywhere they go. Now, just imagine. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I guarantee you, they're gonna show this shit on Sports Center. Uh, Jokic when he go back home. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh! How the fucking whole community. Oh his, yeah. His whole little basketball pavilion that he has out there. Oh, they're going fucking crazy right now. They partying over there. They still think taking shots right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. They'll they'll be up for the remainder of June. On our way out, this is going to be the last time that we respect the game this season. 
Is there anyone that comes to mind? You've done a lot of respecting today, which I appreciate, but is there anyone in particular that comes to mind on this special day on the NBA calendar for our Respect the Game segment? Man, to be honest, I, I just got to keep it rolling. My Respect the Game players are mm. the champs, the Denver Nuggets. Um, just, just to know, for me to know what they went through this season, the ups and downs, the – the naysayers, the haters, uh, the injuries, the locker room shit that we didn't hear about, the locker room shit that we did hear about. And, you know, for them to, to fight through all of that and, and to come out victorious, man, that's it's an awesome thing. So I definitely know what they went through. And I would have to say the whole Denver Nuggets team, you know, head coach on down, definitely are the players – the respect the game players are the, uh, today for me, man. It's, it's the chance. Welcome to the winner's circle. We all yeah. winners here. Rarefied air, a very exclusive fraternity that uh, yes. Rasheed Wallace is there waiting for you with a shot of insert to your favorite alcohol here at the bar that he was just discussing, partying with uh, during his, I had Lord, those stories, those stories I got to get when the, when the red light turns off, but God, for those yeah, of you, yeah, yeah, that's that's when the book come out. <laughs> during, yeah, get ready to pre-order Rashid's book when he's ready to tell all. Uh, that'll be that, that'll be one that you have to have. On that note, for those of you that have made it this far into the season as well as into this episode, uh, we want to thank you, Sheed and I, for spending an hour out of your week to talk about the season with us. You know, I. I, she's got a little bit more experience on this planet as I do. We've got some, uh, some wisdom sticks coming out of our beards and Lord knows yes, that yes. he's got, he's got a lot more stories, but you know, my goal as a part of this program was to always put Rashid in a position. And I told him this before we started doing the show this year that I think this program will thrive. If I can find a way to parallel and your experience in the NBA with what's going on now because the mm -hmm. viewership of like on youtube traditionally skews younger and she you'd be surprised how many viewers weren't even born when you won a title let alone were able to see it right so you're here telling stories about cliff robinson rodney rogers and jason maxiel and these people are like who the hell is he talking about so it's <laughs> it's my job to get that younger audience, as well as the fans like myself that were alive and got to enjoy your championship runs, and that we kind of meet in the middle and educate right. a younger crowd on what has uh, transpired in the past, or you know, keeping you up to date with some of the events in 2023 that's happening on Twitter and bullshit like that. That intersection of of age demographics has always been interesting to me, and getting getting an hour every week out of you. I thought getting an hour might be a challenge. It's been keeping it to an hour. That's been the difficult part. <laughs> so for me, uh, doing this, you know, has right. always been trying to, trying to sprinkle some, some Tinder on top of your embers to, to get you into either story mode, analysis mode. And sometimes you don't even know when you're doing it, which is why, what I love the most when you start like, pulling some shit about one, four high. And then Rip was in the huddle doing this. Like you're, you're getting into it. And I'm just sitting here like, yes, yes, this is what I want right here. It takes a couple of times and I'm going to get some shots up against you. But, um, that was, that was the guts of this program. And, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed doing it with you. I don't know if this will be the, the final episode. We might do some other stuff here as we approach the summer and, and revisit some content. But as for the the NBA calendar, if you will, the fiscal year has come to its conclusion with this in the draft. So we will move forward. Hopefully you guys will join us yeah. and Sheed, any parting words? Definitely. I, from my heart, I just want to thank all of you fans out there who've been with us the whole season um, and listening, listening to us praise and talk shit about your teams. Uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully you won't hold that against us, but uh, Hey, we're just here doing our jobs, having fun for people like you. And definitely stay tuned because there's definitely going to be more from Wob and myself. Um, hey, it was a hell of a ride. It, it was. was. A a ride. I loved it. And I definitely appreciate it. We'll have to do a parade. Going out on top. 
Yeah, you know what? I'll rent us an Uber and I'll we'll do a little parade next time you're either in LA or I come to where you're currently residing. I will uh we'll go through the streets of Franklin together and this is our championship <laughs> parade from a great season of That's What She'd Said. And ladies and gentlemen, this yes. is where we sign off and say goodbye. Thank you again, as always. That's Rashid Wallace. I'm Rob Perez, Worldwide Wob. We will see you on the timeline.